Welcome to Unloose the Goose episode 50. We're at episode, episode 50. That's like half a century. Who's excited about that? I'm excited. Yeah. Talk. I remember way back at episode one when we didn't know what we were doing. Anyway, today we're going to talk about caring for your health and cover some tangible examples of what some of the geese are doing as regards taking care of ourselves as well as the dreaded health insurance expense. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Today I have Jack Spierko from the Survival Podcast on and Xavier Hawk from Thyron and Baseline. And I'm Nicole Sauce from Living Free in Tennessee. Let's start out with the most important question that everybody's been waiting for, though. What are you drinking today, Jack? Well, I was going to be a good guy and I was going to drink LaCroix. And then I had a shitty day, so now I'm drinking my fighting me, the mead that I was drinking the night I got in a fight with Pete. Okay. Fight Three flowers mead. blend. <laughs> Three flowers mead. Xavier, what do you got? Keeping in today's show's topic, I'm actually drinking elderflower or elderberry soda that I made. Yum, elderberry soda. I've got some really awesome spring water that I've carbonated from the holler and, of course, Four Roses bourbon on ice. Because my whole two weeks has been a lot like Jack's day. We'll just put it that way. So yeah. I, I, here's how my day really went. I was going to drink some of my patent bourbon. Yeah. My really good patent bourbon that Colonel Roy brought me. That mm -hmm. You can only get from one place in the whole world. The mm -hmm. bottle's empty. Dorothy drank it mixed with freaking soda. <laughs> Were words exchanged? <laughs> oh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully Colonel Roy will uh, fix that next time he comes to visit, right? Yeah, I hope so. Okay, so that's what everybody's drinking. Let's go to Newsbuster. I was really debating today whether we should talk about duct tape on airplanes or <laughs> Afghanistan because there's been an alarming number of news articles about duct tape on airplanes. And Afghanis on airplanes. There's also been Afghanis on airplanes. In fact, some of them were willing to duct tape themselves to airplanes to flee the country so they would not be killed. And some of them fell to the ground and died. They weren't really using duct tape. They were using their hands. But that's how desperate the situation's gone, gotten there. So let's talk about Afghanistan. Let's see first in the comments, guys. Do you think we should be pulling out of Afghanistan or not? Say why for yes and for no. And um, let's talk about that as geese. Like, what do we think of this whole situation that's bubbled up? Who wants to go first? Okay. I'll jump in then, and I'll <laughs> say that this was a, a tremendous win for the CCP. Um, they're getting the so what happened was the Taliban went to China a couple weeks ago and made a deal with them and was like, "Hey, you know, will you give us support here?" And the Chinese were like, "Yes," and they decided <laughs> that they were going to get all of the <laughs> all of the mineral rights, uh, ports, and all kinds of bases and sort of take over for where the United States was. In exchange, they'd let the Taliban rule and they'd support them. So that was essentially us handing over the, the mineral rights, rare earth minerals and everything to the CCP. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Uh, I, see, I'm in a different camp on that. I don't give two flying fucks of, about who does what with Afghanistan once we leave it. Um, I was not for going to Afghanistan when we went to Afghanistan, and I've been for leaving Afghanistan every second of every minute of every day since we got there, because what we just saw is an inevitability. However, I think once you go do a thing, then you have to be responsible in how you stop doing a thing. And um, people are calling this Saigon 2.0. Saigon was a masterpiece of U.S. ingenuity compared to what's happening right now. This is... This is quite literally, in my opinion, the largest clusterfuck in modern times. Like nothing has ever been this bad in modern times. And this is a disgrace to our country. Um, if, Af you know, if, if China gets the cadmium or whatever that's in Afghanistan, whatever, I, that doesn't matter to me. Um, having 11,000 Americans spread throughout Kabul that can't get to the airport because the potato salad in chief decided to evacuate the military before the civilians. And now he's sending the military back in to sit in the airport and make sure nobody comes in the airport. I, I am. It, it, my expectations of the state are somewhere below where people can see in the live stream. And they have found a new low. This is, I, and now I understand why Kamala Harris is vice president. Cause no one will fucking impeach this guy. 
right? Like th that was clearly the plan. We need a VP that sucks so bad that the most rabid hater of the president's like, we're going to get, no, 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 because this is, I mean, quite, and I'm not, I don't play politics, but man, this is impeachable in my opinion, but I don't want to do it. And if you do, I'm just going to say, you know what you're going to hear for the next three and a half years? <laughs> you don't want that, guys. Stop talking about impeachment, please. Stop it now. Oh, oh we don't need impeachment. Dude's going to dude's gonna step down. No, I don't think he is. You don't? I think in a weekend at Bernie's this bitch all the way through to 2024, man. I'm gonna, I see. I'm starting to see. I'm like, is he going to last the month? Is he going to last the month? He's getting a lot of pressure right now, and they're all talking up. Kamala and featuring how awesome she is. You like the, the narration of the news. What, what yeah. channel is on your TV? Yeah, I yeah. Just, well, I just look at the news that normal people see. Oh. Right. Because I want to know what they're seeing because that kind of tells me what the marketing angle is, right? Of, yeah. Of everything. And this has been such a big cluster that it had to be intentional. There's no way you're that incompetent. Is there? Oh, they didn't just leave, you know, the, the civilians and citizens there. They left all of their military equipment, yeah. weapons, missiles, uh, intel. Uh, they tweeted out the other day a picture where in the background you could see the names of all of their intelligence operatives there and their locations. Like, like you could just go on social media and go find that information out if you were running a, a special ops against them. Right? Yeah, that's also impeachable. That, that, that goes square at Biden's feet. That, but that that's goes to Nicole's point. It's like, this has it's so stupid it's got to be intentional yeah the we only thing so fast we can't move planes which fly last time i checked out yeah. right am i wrong about that um they shut down eva evacuation and flights but they brought them back up like 12 hours later they did it because they had people like climbing on the wheel wells and falling out of the sky so they yeah. like right. we have to not do this so once they got their shit under control they stopped doing that the only good news with losing all this armament yeah. to these people, like the M16s, the the 230 saws, the M60s and all, that's bad shit. They're, they know how to work that, and it doesn't take up genius to figure out how to maintain it. They have now more Blackhawks than any other military force in the, in the world other than us. They have U.S. military fighter aircraft, but none of that shit, even if they find somebody that can fly it, is going to be maintainable for them within six months. That's about the maximum amount of time any of our mm -hmm. aircraft can stay serviceable without very specialized maintenance. Are you um, saying they left the planes and the helicopters? Yes, yes. the military planes. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Don't those like fly over the border if you want them yeah, to? Yeah, but I, I'm kind of like living for the day the first Taliban jumps in a freaking F-16 and just to see how that works out. I don't, <laughs> I like if you can fly a Cessna, that does not equal flying an F-16. Um, nor does it equal maintaining an F-16. And I don't think – I do agree with Xavier on the, the goals of the Chinese, but I don't think the Chinese are going to be able to come in and provide maintenance and serviceability and parts, et cetera, for U.S. military combat aircraft. However, like what's really bad right now that like anybody that can work a freaking remote-controlled buggy can, can run is they have some of like three-plus million-dollar top-of-the-line – uh, helicopter style drones that they got their hands on that are ah. like state of the art surveillance equipment. What? So if they want to cause Wait, some, yes, 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 yes. They're like three and a half million dollar drones that the How Taliban you now have. And leave all of that technology. Well, okay. So it's, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying, here's how it happens. So it's not like we said, Hey, you know, what's a good idea, guys. Let's just let the Taliban have all this. We, we provided all this equipment not for our soldiers who ran away and left it, but for the Afghan army. Right. So if we would have taken it all when this shit oh, started, God. well, then the odds that the Afghan army was going to stand up would have been even lower than the zero that they were going to. They so like, it was this pretense that we had we had armed them. Uh, Biden said we I'm had 300,000 armed Afghani troops between the Air Force and the army and only 75,000 Taliban. The problem is those 300,000 troops never wanted to fight. And I don't know how many Afghan vets you've talked to, but I mean, I'm going to go back to like people that served in 05, 06, all the way up to last year. Every single one that ever talked to me said, it's a shit show. The day we leave, it collapses. 
And yeah. so from private to, to, to field grade officers and above, every single person that touched it that ever talked to me about it said the same words. And so this idea that we didn't know it was going to happen is total shit. It's yeah. total shit. Privates knew it. Freaking colonels knew it. And everybody I'm in between knew it. rescue efforts right now. And we've got people in on the ground there with helicopters, with planes, people who want to get from here to there. And they're like, we want to evacuate as many people as we can and equipment. And I'm like, yeah. like what equipment? Now I'm like, oh. Oh, equipment. Well, I want you to think about this, right? So when we decided to leave, and we left Bakram Air Base, which would have been a much better place to, uh, to, to evacuate our people from. And we went to Kabul airport, which was stupid. Even with that, once they knew we were leaving, like all the Taliban came out of their holes and they came driving thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them in straight lines down these roads. All we had to do was throw a few predators up in the air. Right. And we could have wiped out half of the entire Taliban in 15 minutes. Yeah. And I'm not saying necessarily we should have, right, if we're actually leaving, but we might have like, I don't know, the first 15 of them just okay now you know what guys we're not done yet yeah you're gonna this shithole will be your shithole in mid-september you stay the hell away from our people until we get this done and you know what they would have said okay yeah okay. but when you just say come on in i mean we could have we could have been really dastardly bastards here if if we wanted to be cunning like the, the chai comms would have right we could have said, yeah, we're leaving. And when they all convoyed, we could have freaking wiped them out like we did in Baghdad at the end of the first Gulf War. Yeah. We, we, we could have killed 50,000 Taliban in 15 minutes if we wanted to. Yep. And I'm not saying we should have. I'm just saying that's how incompetent we are. Well, I mean, having the military leave first. I don't know in what world that ever made sense. No. But you, know, you said it before we even jumped in the show, right? You said uh, it, it's hard to watch something that you agree with pulling out of Afghanistan be executed in such an incompetent way. Because now what's, 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 what, what are people calling for going back to Afghanistan? And don't you think we, we, we should have never been there in the first place. We shouldn't have been in right. there. No, we shouldn't have been there, but we were. But like, if we're going to do this... And we give the Afghan army a three and a half million dollar drone. Don't you think we should have built like a back door in there where like one of our computer techs could just go, you won't be needing this. Boom. Right. right. Could, I mean, we didn't even have to blow it up. Just like short out the circuit boards or something like yeah. why are we? And I think it's like 10 of those. That, that the oh, Taliban now some, owns. some trouble in the next few months, you know, but I'm also seeing like stupidity in the media. Like that's a surprise. Like, um, I, I saw my, my wife came to me two days ago, I think, and she said, the Taliban controls the skies over Kabul. And I'm like, no, they don't. Because even if we they, they do get a hold of an F-16, they can't fly it. Yeah. And so I looked at it, and there were, there were articles from the AP, articles from um, whoever the equivalent in, in Europe and Britain is. And that's what it said for a headline. But then it was about these drones. So by having a few drones, they control the skies. Anybody that knows military terminology you know what it means when you say you control the skies. That means anything on the ground you don't like, it's blurted, right? right. And that was not so – like, there's just so much dumb going on. I don't know. And then the Taliban says anybody that wants to leave can, but then they're, like, rounding they people can't. up. They just shot some lady this morning because she didn't wear a bur burqa right. Mm -hmm. I mean, so this is a disaster. But That's how that goes, though. See, but this is what's going to do, right? I think they're going to take the American people and say, oh, we should have never left, whatever, and, like – Use all this instead of making the point we're making, which is this is not how you execute a withdrawal. Because what I found myself when 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 the potato salad in chief was talking, agreeing with a lot of what he said, except going, that's not what you're doing. Because when he's like, this is where empires go to die. Yes, that's why we shouldn't have went there. That, that you can't win a war when you spend 20 years and $83 billion trying to stand up an army and they won't stand up. I agree, but... Man, the way we did this, I, I don't want to get totally sidetracked from our main show there tonight, but that's okay. I kind of want to beat somebody's ass over this. I, I mean, I really do. I think a lot of people do. It's it's hard to watch. I mean, I'm watching people panic because their friends in Afghanistan can't get out, and some of those friends are now dead. Yep. And I think what we need to do right now, we one thing we did learn over the last twenty yeah. years, we can we can beat the fuck out of the Taliban anytime we want to. 
the oh, Afghan totally. army can't, but we can. We need to tell them, y'all need to just step your ass just outside of Kabul till we're done and let our people out. And if you don't do it, we're going to make this hard and maybe you don't get your shithole back by mid-September. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, I'd, if I was president, I'd make, I'd say whoever the highest ranking son of a bitch you can get on the phone with me, right? I want to talk to him right now. And when they say, well, we don't want to dignify, no, shut up and get him on the phone. And then I think what would happen is, do you see the guy to your left? You see how he's gone now? Now move your shit out of the way till we're done. I mean, I think that's the kind of level where, because like manually cleaning this up now, it's a bloodbath. We're going to end up with a bunch of guys from the 82nd or Marine Recon or something in horrible firefights over this. Yep. Yep. We don't have, we don't have to do that that way. Nope. And, and I hope nobody listening to me that doesn't know me, that's new to me for whatever yeah. reason, doesn't think that I'm for like blowing the shit out of people. I'm not, but I am for getting my people the hell out. Like I'll give the potato in chief is, is, is and Xavier gets credit for that name. Um, <laughs> I will give him, except I added salad, right? Mm-hmm. I will give him that he did inherit this, but there's a way. And, and so if you want to say that there's a way to do this, my other thing, though, is I'm tired of hearing that shit because he had eight years of influence on it under Obama. Last thing I want to say about all of this is if anybody out there has connections with private contractors who have planes or helicopters and or personnel that want to get over there and rescue people, DM me on the Telegram chat uh, and I'll get you connected with the right people or get them connected with the right people. And that is happening, by the way. There's yeah. several organizations doing it. Cool. OK, next segment is the main topic of the show. (laughs) We had a question in on email from a listener who said they want to hear what the gaggle does about healthcare and they meant health insurance. And rather than take the advice of my agent who has put me into a thousand dollar a month plan, this person's looking at not being at a job where, where health insurance is provided wants to more know just like in today's reality of the United States of America, what are you doing for health insurance? And I want to start with like, I worked in healthcare policy for five years. I watched Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, get passed late at night. I was, I literally cried and was depressed for a week after that because it just built wor- bad policy on top of bad policy. And and I know that fixing bad policy by adding bad policy never works. Hundred percent of the time fails. And I saw it as the foundation for getting socialized healthcare in this country. And yep. that's where we are today is we are under the affordable care act. that has been reinterpreted by another president is going to get reinterpreted by this president. Cause a lot of policy gets made by rules rather than by the, the lawmakers. Right. And I think part of why this is so hard is is that you have layer on layer on layer of healthcare abuses, some of them under the guise of making it free market that regulate the market. And so people are confused about how free markets would impact healthcare. Um, If you're a doctor and you will go against what you're told you're supposed to do, you can lose your license. So there's risk for people standing up. We're watching mandates go out in states right now where if you're a healthcare worker, you have to get the vaccine according to your state or you can't practice medicine, they'll pull your license. So there are all these layers going on that are all, of course, designed to favor lobbies, the the, the special interests of lobbies. And none of these laws seem to actually help people, which is how they're sold. So that's where we're at. Anything to add to that, guys? I'll go back to the same proposition that I have on this whole affair called Earth is that we're basically a farm. And if anybody thinks that this farm is here to serve you, you are mistaken. You are here to serve the system, serve the farm, serve, you know, the the powers that be, if you want to call them that. The idea that healthcare is, it's a misnomer, right? It's not actually caring for your health. It's actually keeping you dependent upon a system that, that is unhealthy. The, the healthy thing to do is to eat well with high nutritionally dense food. The right thing to do is to learn herbalism and all of the, the different the different plants that are there to benefit you. There was a, a study done with one of my partners where they had 36 different groups growing the same genetic strain of crop in their backyard. 
one of those individuals, and they got tested every day. They took blood sugar and a pulse oximeter and all of this like 12 times throughout the day. Yeah. They found that the person who was vitamin K deficient, and they were all growing the specific variety of tomatoes. The person who was vitamin K deficient, the tomatoes were literally growing more vitamin K in their system at their own detriment, like poisoning and toxifying themselves as a plant so that they couldn't survive simply to create more vitamin K because at, in, in the morphogenetic field, they could sense that this person was vitamin K deficient. Not only that, she was not able to uptake vitamin K since she was a kid like orally, intravenously, it was just not working. These plants were the only way that she was actually able to uptake vitamin K and it actually cured her of her vitamin K deficiency. So my point here is, is that the food that we eat is the medicine that we treat ourselves with. So to going back to the whole rant here is that the, the healthcare system, the, the federalized system of healthcare, the, the, the uh, Obamacare's and, and all of that, is really just to factory farm you in the same way that they took birthing, which was a completely natural process, and turned it into a system for generating revenue and controlling. So I'm hesitant to join, any, like, I never joined a healthcare, uh, uh, like when my, when my employers back in the day were giving them, I never took one because I did not understand why I needed to spend money in case something bad happened because I guess I live by the seat of my pants and nothing really bad has happened. So, you know, knock on wood for that. But you, I would always rather just deal with the treatment as necessary in ways that I understand. And if, and I'm sort of like Marley in that way, like I don't want to go, you know, get chemotherapy if I get cancer. Like that's not going to be a thing that happens for me. Uh -huh. So my approach has always been, you know, avoid the system and care for myself properly in the way humans should. Jack. So I'm glad he said that because. I believe everything he said, but, and I think what can happen a lot of times, let's first of all acknowledge the problem that you were asked about, which is why we're talking about this. People need, at least in their minds, some form of health insurance and it's very expensive. So while I agree with everything X just said, it doesn't fix that problem, right? Um, now, here's here's where I take my my difference with this. Yes, but in that, Okay, so people talk about terrain theory and germ theory. And classically, they explain this with a fish tank, that if you believe in germ theory and your fish get a bacteria, you give them an antibiotic. If they get a fungal infection, you give them an antifungal. And what terrain theory, uh, terrain theory teaches is the pathogen is not the problem. The environment is, so clean the freaking fish tank. Okay. Those two worlds are often looked at as independent. I don't think they should be. I think a perfectly healthy person who's well infused with nutrients can definitely get something like bacterial meningitis and die very, very quickly. I also think a person that is robust and healthy in most instances will easily fight off things like coronavirus and flus and stuff like that. But not always. The 1918 flu in particular hit people with the strongest immune systems kind of the hardest. It was this backlash. So as someone that I see, when people say this analogy, I'm like, well, do you guys understand like how many fish tanks there are <laughs> right in this in this house and in, in, in my life? Right. I, I actually keep fish. So I know how this works. And what you do when you get a fungal infection or. Uh, a parasite known as ick, or you get a bacterial infection is you clean the fucking fish tank and you treat the infection. And so what I mean by that is that there's a point in time where any of us, we need modern medical support if we don't want to like be really miserable and or die. So X says he doesn't want chemo. 90% chance I don't want either. Let me tell you what I do. The cancer I have is easily treatable with a very high success record with chemotherapy. <laughs> Bring it on, baby. I, then I want that, right? Like I will make any individual medical decision at the time that I actually have to make that medical decision with all the information that goes with making that medical decision. So I know people, for instance, that have had cancers. They've been relatively easy cancers to treat using modern medicine, yet they are fatal without it. And they have treated their cancers. They've gone into remission. They're 10 years past that they're going on with their lives. My wife had a condition called tri trigeminal neuralgia almost 20 years ago. It's known as a suicide disease. 
And what happens is you get a, a, a vein or an artery that goes across your fifth trigeminal nerve, which is the nerve that comes out of your brainstem and down the side of your face. And it's like somebody randomly setting off high voltage electricity in your face. It's actually called the suicide disease. You can put all the herbs on it. You can rub it with dandelions. You can smoke dope. You can do whatever you want. You know what's going to happen? It's going to keep happening. You need a surgeon to drill a hole in the back of your head and remove the problem. So I think we have to be honest about the fact that we have an incredible thing in modern medicine that's ridiculously overused and used to make people sick at the same time. And it's up to us to know the difference. And then we do need to figure out how do we make access to this amazing medicine affordable. Then we also need to take total control as best we can in a situation. My wife and I just went through COVID a couple of weeks ago. For me, I don't even know I would have known it was COVID if she didn't get it too. I mean, it was really not that big a deal. My biggest thing was brain fog and not knowing what the hell I was doing. Um, she had an incredibly bad sore throat and she couldn't swallow for a couple of days. Well, you're going to get dehydrated. So instead of going to an ER, we went to a family practitioner who we knew would actually treat the symptom, which was swelling, gave her a steroid shot, boom, swelling's gone. Now she can swallow, now she can drink. However, by the end of that next day, she had really low blood pressure, she was getting dizzy, and we figured out she's dehydrated. If we had taken her to an ER and said she's dehydrated, give her fluids, they would say, oh, she's COVID positive, fluids are not a treatment for COVID. Do you know what fluids are a treatment for? Dehydration, which they would. And I'm telling you flat out, I have an EMT in my audience. He had to go to the ER. He worked out of three times before they would give him fluids. So what did we do? We called a company called Hydration Pros. One hour after we made the phone call for a few hundred dollars, they were here. They gave her two units of fluids and a buttload of freaking uh, vitamins. So we used a private solution for that. She passed out, went to sleep because she could actually sleep, woke up, she was fine, and she recovered just fine after that. This would have she would have been a hospital statistic had we went to the hospital either of the two times that she needed help. So we took that onto ourselves and we did it with a modern practitioner and an alter basically not really an alternative practitioner, but somebody outside of what you think of as medicine. A hangover cure. Right. Basically, it's a hangover cure, yes. Yeah. However, we could have needed advanced medical care. And so I also have insurance and it's expensive and I don't like it. And it feels like it doesn't cover anything. But if I have a heart attack and I'm going to die and they need to crack my chest open, I want them, I don't want them to sit there and wonder whether they're going to get paid or not. So what do you think about like emergency insurances or catastrophic insurance? Yeah, that's a question off Odyssey too. From Clyde It's a great Liberty. idea and it's what I used to do. I've been self-employed most of my life and we always carried... We called it catastrophic, but basically what that is is an insurance plan with a great big giant deductible. Yeah. And then that way when yeah. you need to have – you have a yield sign in your spleen in an auto accident, they just do it. Or maybe you're on the hood for 20 grand, but you don't die and you don't go bankrupt. And, and basically catastrophic has been made illegal. There's not really a good way to – and what we used to do before they fixed it with Obamacare, we had an HSA, a health savings account. We put a bunch of money into it until we got it up to where it covered that $20,000 deductible. We were actually able to earn like a little, like almost like a, a, a certificate of deposit level of interest on it, like 2%. 1%, yeah. It right? And it could stay there until we retired. And if we didn't use it, we could take the money out like an IRA without a penalty. And all of that went to hell when Obamacare came in. And I was totally happy with my health insurance. I know not everybody was, but I was. I was. Until I had that same plan. And now I'm miserable. You know what? You can do catastrophic now. Again, okay. Because you can have these, what are called temporary insurance plans that are basically a high deductible insurance program that's less per month. And when Trump was in office, he eliminated the time limit on how long you could have it. And last I heard, they hadn't reinstated it. It used to be you could only have it for like six months and then you had to enroll in Obamacare at yeah. one of the open enrollment windows. It was designed to get you from, oh no, I'm sick now to, to open enrollment. But yeah. I feel but, like I have like half catastrophic for five times the price now. Yeah. Because they don't cover anything. I don't, I'm like X. I only go to the doctor if I need to. 
right? So I haven't been to the doctor in decades, honest to God. I don't want to go unless I need to go. But yet I have this huge expense. The only thing that makes me not like, I don't know, start stringing insurance executives up by their thumbs is that I get, since I'm self-employed, I deduct it all. And it, it makes it hurt a little bit less. Nicole, yeah. what do you know about private medical groups or private insurance groups? So, well, like memberships. So memberships, which is con it's called concierge medicine. If you want to Google one in your area or memberships, a lot of doctors are moving to a subscription style service where you pay a monthly fee. And this is usually going to be your OBGYN or your primary care doctor. You'll pay 50 bucks a month and they'll see you whenever you want. They do te telemed. They take on a certain number of clients and that's it. And then if you need to be referred to a specialist, you go, you have to pay that specialist, which is above and beyond it. So the, the concierge medicine has been one of the quote unquote free market solutions because the big problem you have with all of these different insurances is they limit which doctors you can see. And then if you go, quote unquote, out of network, it costs a ton of money and isn't covered by your insurance anyway. So if you're in a hospital, you'll see one doctor that's in network and then some random nurse will pop in to make sure you're still breathing in the emergency room. And that's not in network. And that gets billed separately uh, because yeah, every every person that walks into your emergency room visit is a different bill and they don't care if they're in network or not they're going to get paid either way because you signed a thing on the way and it said you'll pay it. So when you have something happen, you will find that a lot of your care is out of network. Concierge medicine eliminates that on the primary care side, just because you can go in and everybody you see is part it's paid for already. Yeah. In Asheville, I, I, we, we had one, we had a family plan with a, a doctor there and for yeah. our, you know, kid wellness checkups and things like that. What do you know about adventure uh, or travel insurance? Travel. I, I, hold on real quick because there's a question or a statement here and, and before you guys go past that this is this has always been my issue with that thing that's great for people that go to the doctor all the time to have their butt checked and wellness checkups and get vaccines and and, and i have a sniffle so i'm going to go to the doctor it handles that routine office visit it doesn't do anything for the reason i actually have to have insurance if right. I get cancer, if I get heart disease, if I need an organ transplant, if I get in a car wreck, if I get a motorcycle wreck, if somebody shoots me at a training exercise, like those are the reasons I actually have insurance. And it seems to me that those, you know, your family doctor and all that's fine for people that have like, I don't know. I look at it this way. I say some people have a personal relationship with their doctor. They know their doctor better than they know their kid's teacher or whatever. <laughs> like, and if you're one of those people that calls ass to the doctor three or four times a month, I get it. But what the hell good does that do me? Last time I went to the doctor was for a for a for a uh, physical for employment. You know how long it's been since I had a job. So does that do a person like me any good at all? And I just That's, don't think it does. Well, so a lot of people who do the concierge or subscription medicine pair it with something else. Okay, so pair it with what is now how catastrophic plans are now being done which is temporary insurance right or they'll do what i've done and get a health share so health share is not health insurance you're sharing expenses in a network but until i have you know up to five thousand dollars per incident by the way so if i have cancer and break my arm that's ten thousand dollars out of pocket before anything's covered because that's two different things um until that kicks in, it's not a shared expense from the network. And then all of those monthly fees go into a pool that's paying for the, the people who do get cancer in that group. The reason the health share is allowed is it's a religious exemption that was built into the Affordable Care Act. Um, new ones are not allowed to be created after the passing of the Affordable Care Act. But if existing health shares basically allow you to use their charter, you can do it, which is why you're seeing ones that look new. It's because the Mennonites are very chartered nice under the us. other one. The Mennonites let you do a, a, use their charter to do a variety of different things in your own network. And then they pair that with insurance riders for really expensive things that happen to people. So they and have they're, their they're own allowed to say no. Life. Huh? Right. So I actually need to check this into if this. If you're fat, they can say no. 
I was going to say, so three years ago when I looked into this and I weighed 67 pounds more than I do, right. they said no fat boy. And I really need to go back and look at that again because I'm sure they let me in yeah. now at 200 what pounds. What it is not what's is the insurance. Name of that, what's the name of that group? Health, there, health shares? There's different. So they're called health share. And there's one for people who are who are Christian and go to church and are, are in good standing with their church and their pastor will attest to that or priest. Health share ministries is one they go to. Liberty Health Share, because there's always a faith-based declaration. Liberty Health Share doesn't really care what faith you are. You just say, I believe when you're one. in. Um, I'm at, who am I at? Well, I just changed recently to the one John Bush has because I was having some issues with my health share not processing paperwork, which didn't yeah. really matter because it just went to the deductible, but I wanted it there in case something happened. Um and it'll come to me later in the show. So there's a lot of different ones. Just look up health share online and then investigate if you think they're good. The deal is it's not insurance. It's not insurance. It's not insurance. No. You will find yourself asking for a thing called a super bill that you send to them yourself. If your doctor does not know how to fax a super bill to them, you will find yourself with things that you thought were covered, like podiatry that's not covered right? You need to read the contract and then decide if it's a good fit. For me, it's a good fit because my out of pocket is about 200 bucks every month. And that, that will kick in if I have something terrible happen. And then they do include like your wellness exam every year, which, which is like the pap smear for the ladies. Um, that's included. What you're talking and I can't hear you X you're muted. Sorry, it's, it's my fault. I, 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 I'll let you know. I was sending you a private chat. I'm muting you when you're not talking because you're fucking with shit and you're making noise. Sorry. So now you know. Yeah. I wasn't gonna, I was gonna call you out. I was sending you a private message and I got I got <laughs> caught. I was like, is my air conditioning too loud or something? I didn't. No, realize. you're fucking around like this. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, so is it Liberty? Is that the one Le that you and John are using? No, I'm using. I'll I'll tell you in a second. I'll pull it up. Um, and Rob on, on YouTube chat, I see your question about chronic conditions. If you have a chronic condition like diabetes, they will not cover it. If you are diagnosed with diabetes after you go, after you start the health share, they will cover your prescription for a certain amount of time. It might be 30 days. It might be 90 days. It might be six months. And then they expect you to build into your budget the ability to pay for things that you should be paying for on a regular basis. They have negotiated rates for prescriptions, but if you end up dependent on a prescription, that's only going to be covered for a certain amount of time before you have to pay for it. And that's why it's important to read the, the contract. And they can also say, Rob, you have a heart condition. We're not covering any heart stuff, but we'll cover everything else. They have the freedom to say that. And, and weird shit can happen like, while we were applying, not only did they tell me I was a fat boy and they wouldn't let me in, um, Dorothy was suspected of having diverticulitis, which she did not. Mm. And they denied us until they knew whether she had it or not. It's kind of one of those things. It's hard to get in, but once you're in, you're in. Yeah. Um, and and that is, that is that that's part of the trade-off with it. Um, and also, I think it's important to understand what you said about like this whole thing with being in good standing with your church and all. My son looked into one and they were like, you had to have, I didn't even know there was such thing. Your church records. You had to send yeah. like Sheldon Cooper with his haircut records. They got to send your <laughs> church records in. And that just seems like nonsense to me. I mean, okay. So I'm using Zion now. Z-I-O-N. That's just Zion. what I'm using. It's, it does not cover as much as Liberty, but I was happier with their customer service. That's hundred percent why I did it. And I am not going to church on the regular. So take that information for what you will. I do think there's something to investing in yourself, in your health. I take a lot of supplements. Um, when I went keto, I lost all the weight that I did. I exercise every day. I use a lot of herbs, both like intentional herbs where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm actually taking this herb and I'm taking it for a reason. But I also use just a lot of different fresh herbs culinarily and that has a very tonifying effect and i think we should like don't let what i said about terrain and germ theory take away the terrain theory i'm just saying let's not live in denial 
because there are people, and I, I've run across a lot of them lately with COVID that seem to think that if you're perfectly healthy, you could walk into a den full of people that have smallpox and they could spit on you and you're not going to get smallpox. And I'm sorry, I think that's living in a world of denial. I think healthy people can get sick. They're just less likely to, if that makes sense. And I think we need to be honest about that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, there is one more solution on the traditional med medical side that people don't realize. And I, I first started learning about this in Oregon before I moved to Tennessee. And they thought I was like this alien from Mars when I would come in and say, how much is my appointment going to cost? And they would, you know, four phone calls later, eventually come up with a price. And I'd say, OK, how much will you give it to me for if I pay cash today? And often it would be about 25 percent less. So I would have to negotiate my rates in advance. That's called. OK, it's a wild idea. Just bear with me on this one. Cash for service. See, like you go use the doctor and wow. then you pay them. Whoa. Well, they have this thing now called cash what clinics. And if you look up the free market medical association, they'll list a bunch of them. The one I know the most about is in Oklahoma city and they publish their rates for what they do, like a knee replacement. I don't know what it is, but let's say it's $60,000 for a knee replacement. That's all in. That's your anesthesiologist. That's the knee replacement. That's the surgery. That's the recovery. That's all of it. The deal is you have to pay them. They will give you a super bill and you can bill your insurance. They do not bill insurance. They do not take insurance. They only take cash. And they also, if that fails, will redo it for free, which is totally different than the medical system where you're spending well over $100,000 for a knee replacement through your insurance. And if it fails, you pay a hundred thousand dollars a second time. So the cash clinics publish their rates. I know and here in Tennessee, we have a great network called satellite med that when I go there, I know what I'm going to pay. And sometimes I'm grumpy about it, but I know what I'm going to pay. And that's what I pay. It's not like surprise bills come for the next six months. So I go there whenever I can, if I have to go, like I had a bee sting that was putting me into anaphylactic shock. I went there instead of the emergency room they put me on um, whatever that is, e epinephrine, whatever that I forget what it's called. Epi, okay. Yeah, so basically on in an IV, the whole incident cost me $329. It's better than dying. It's better than dying. They prescribed me an EpiPen, which I have 100%. now. But yeah, they. I mean, it was pretty cool. Emergency room, that would have been a $5,000 to, to $10,000 incident here. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. that brings up a, a whole nother topic is, is medical tourism, right? I have oh, friends yeah. who have medical dental stuff and they go to Ecuador and the entire cost of a two week Smart. vacation plus air travel is, is cheaper than the, what, what they'd spend here in the States. And you're not laying so, in an and, ICU and was, for 10 days, right? So it's not like you don't enjoy your vacation. You just don't eat empanadas for one day. Right. Right, right, exactly. And and now that doesn't obviously work if you break a bone or, you know, you have something that's immediate life threatening. But if you have like, you know, even even cancer and you know that you're, you've got cancer or something and you, you can actually find a lot cheaper um, solutions out there around the world. Back surgery, anything that, you have time before you get it done, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. Indian it's reservations are starting to talk about done. doing more stuff like that too, right? Like they have their own, you know, people that went to actual medical school and yeah. you know, it's not some guy that got his got his freaking uh doctor's license from a cracker jack box or some legitimate doctor that can do a you know good job. I I think though one of the things we have to look at with this is like how much of this is we always kind of divide between us and them or the people in the state. Like how much is this is the people's fault? I think a lot of it is. And I don't just mean letting the state do shit or asking the state to fix things, because that's always a bad idea. Yeah. What I mean is what people expect for, for insurance to do, right? So people expect, I want to have insurance for a couple hundred dollars a month, if that. Uh, I want a $20 copay, and I want it to pay for everything that I ever need, including all my prescriptions. And I think that's unreasonable. It would be like saying, what I want to do, <laughs> I want to buy insurance for my car. And the $500 deductible is fine, but the insurance should pay for my gas, my oil changes, 
my car washes, right? Like my tune-ups, a mechanic to check out my car once a quarter. And if I get in a wreck and if my car breaks down, like that's what people seem to want. And I'm talking about the average idiot wants from their insurance. They think, and, and I think the reason they want it, there was a brief window as all this was kind of being redone. I remember back in like the early 90s as a single guy, didn't have a family. My insurance was like eight out of my paycheck and my employer was paying like 50%, right? So it was probably like 130 bucks, but I was paying like 80 bucks. And literally it covered everything. There was like, if I went to the doctor, $15. If I needed a prescription, $15. If I got in a wreck and needed 78 of my bones put back together, it was 20 bucks up to like after a quarter million, I had to pay some extra money. And and that brief window when insurance kind of hit that space for like 10 seconds, that's what people want. And I know the medical industry is scum. I know the pharmaceutical industry is scum. And I know the insurance industry is scum. I also know they can't give you that. That's not reasonable to think any private no. institution could ever give you that. Yeah, it's not because everybody's so complex. <laughs> I just looked it up. A hip surgery, but you know what? like the, a hip the replacement, is fifteen thousand four five hundred dollars, basically yeah. at the surgery center in Oklahoma. Like compared to going into six figures, I would and fly to Oklahoma for that. For, yeah. What, what, what's what's cancer treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cost? I mean, I don't know. I'll look. I don't either. I'm just saying it's probably it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Yeah. 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 It's hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Now the like a three fifty bee sting, right? That is reasonable yeah. uh, in my mind because like yeah. you're actually paying for a service that somebody has learned all of the ins and outs of, hopefully, and you know that's that's high value. Um, but like what you said about lymphoma or whatever, like that's that is exorbitant. Or you get sick and you go to the hospital and you and it's and it's literally nothing. You've got a fifteen thousand dollar bill, poof, like that, and that yeah. doesn't yeah. make sense. Thailand's well, another great Lino, place right? to go, by the way, for a surgery. Thailand has 100% institutions oriented towards medical tourism. If you need heart surgery or something, you can go there if you can get there. Yep. Yep. But let's say that I have Jack's Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Yeah. And Xavier <laughs> gets cancer of the butthole or whatever. And you, you come in to get treatment for me. And I end up giving you a bill for $190,000. The reason I give you a bill for $190,000 is if you do have insurance and if they will pay the bill, to get them to pay me like $70,000, I have to bill them $190,000, which means when your insurance doesn't pay it, that's the bill you get. And so the entire system is the problem in that these services do not cost what you pay for them. Blue Cross, Blue Shield does not pay that much for your tonsillectomy for your kid. No. Right? No, you get a bill for like right. $8,800 to have tonsils popped out of a five-year-old, but Blue Cross Blue Shield pays like 1200 bucks. Right. And, and, but you don't. And, and that is, to me, that is where all the problems come from. If I hate the state, but we have it. And if you made me like evil overlord, like our buddy Nick Ferguson, uh, Nicole, he yeah. said he would never be president because you can't do shit. But yeah. he'd be king. If you let him be king for a while, he'd be king. <laughs> and if you made him be king, what I'd say is, okay, whatever you want to charge for your shit, that's what you charge for your shit as far as medicine goes. You charge everybody the same. If if you charge Blue Cross or Concentra or whatever, 85 bucks for this thing, and Xavier Hawk walks in off the street and says, I'm sick enough, I need you to do this for me my mushrooms aren't going to work or my peyote's not going to work or whatever, then you charge Xavier Hawk $85. You charge whatever you want, but two things. One, in defense of the orange man, you tell people what the fuck the bill's going to be before you provide the service. Yes. Right? And and somebody should be able to call you and say, I just got a, a, a an estimate for this thing, this procedure. How much is your... And you should be able to give them a price. And you should be able to shop it around. Charge whatever yep. you want, but you just charge everybody the same. Yep. And I know that sounds like socialism or whatever, or pricing controls. How is that? You socialism? didn't have all these That's other like shit bolted onto it. I would agree with you, but you do have all this other shit bolted onto it. Ask your question, right. Xavier. 
No, I was just saying that's not that's not socialism. That's actually free market. This is what my prices are. Everybody should be everybody should be in it should be enforced. I don't know that that's the right word, but like yeah. that should be the standard. Because it's not a quantity God discount, forbid, right? You walk because into Cassandra a doesn't call them up. Cassandra but if doesn't you walk call into them up a and Starbucks, say, gonna... you will see the price for the latte yes. is what the price for the latte is, what the price and sometimes they run specials and groupons. Yeah. But it's the price of a latte. But if I call them up and I go, I want to buy a thousand cups of coffee a month, maybe they'll make me a deal. But that's not what the insurance companies do. They right. don't say we're going to give you a thousand tonsillectomies a month at this location. They're not doing a quantity discount. They're doing a total money. And they're not even doing a total money discount. They're doing a power play. You want us to cover shit. Yep. This is what you're going to do for us. It's like a mock. It's not free market. It's more like mafia, right? Like, like, hey, we're concentric. You yeah, don't want well, to play like ball. Well, it's like after a hurricane. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, well, it's, and then it's, it's worse. Like, like a after a hurricane. If you have insurance through Obamacare, this happened to me once with somebody I knew, needed to get an MRI, had paid cash for an MRI 12 months before, 450 bucks. That was the price that happened after, hey, if I pay you right now, how much is it? Under insurance with the high deductible, $1,250. The negotiated rate was three times, a little you know, under three times, but basically three times the cash price. And then on the other side, you'll have cash prices that are four or five times the price that's negotiated because they're, they have to make up the difference because they're losing money on the insured people. That's like the justification given for it. That's have not how to run a business. Shit, have you ever seen shit like this, even like a Walmart pharmacy? Like, my wife goes in to get a prescription. This is years ago. Yeah. And she's like, well, how much is my prescription? Or like, it's your copay. It's $25. And she's like, wait a minute. This, whatever this medication was, this it's stupid cheap. And it's like a week's worth. Well, how much is it? $8.50. It was $8.50. But even though it was $8.50, if you used your insurance, you had to pay your full copay. Okay. But if you just said, you know what? Fuck it. Don't put it on my insurance. Yeah. I'll give you the 850. But what ended up happening, because I remember, I was almost like, I don't know why it takes so long to fucking change this, but give them the $25 because I've spent more than $25 <laughs> of my life force in this place looking at these people that I don't want to see. Because it took forever. It was like it was like an act of Congress to just pay them cash. Like and this this whole and this was before it was fucked up by the way right this is when it was good and and so I don't know that we like usually we try to give people good answers I don't know we have a good answer we have what everybody does I buy conventional insurance and 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 I have the income where I can afford to and I do it to insure myself and my wife if something catastrophic happens yeah Nicole uses a health share. Health share. And, and cash clinic. And Xavier are my eats flies by the seat of his ass. Like, eat it, yeah. whatever. Xavier eats good food and takes care of himself, which is the best answer, probably. But it doesn't It doesn't help Xavier if he gets in a motorcycle wreck and wakes up and sees a stop sign in his guts, right? Oh, dude. Like, okay. Yeah. You guys yeah. reminded me that's like, Ford. I took this emergency medical class at um, James Yeager. James Yeager's in Camden, the, what is it called? Tactical Response. Yeah. And they showed I have us insurance a video for my there. family, but not for me. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they showed so us some dirt on we're it. We're talking about right. stop bleeding. They showed us this gel that the FDA hasn't approved. That's basically made out of algae by okay. a 15 year old kid. I mean, he's more than 15 now. That it instantly stops bleeding, like within two seconds, and rebuilds the tissue that is there. Like if it's blood vein tissue it's blood vein tissue if it's liver tissue it's liver tissue like it mimics in 3d the tissue in two seconds i think that's awesome i still think if xavier on his chopper ends up with a uh, a stop sign in his small intestine he needs a surgeon i don't think I, algae gel is going to put his small intestine back together i don't no. think it's going to happen yeah. well right? that's a totally different thing but, you but know. i think she's bringing up a point and it just reminded me of a friend of mine's product called briotech and it's essentially a, a topical spray and it's hypochloride, but you can actually inhale it. Right. And I'm not yeah. saying going out, go out and do this, but he got COVID, <laughs> got tested, got positive, sprayed that shit up his nose and it like disinfects his interior. 
Um, and it, it actually, he, he can't state that it cures a bunch of things, but it does scientifically. And he's actually a doctor, but he had to market it as a topical, um, a topical cream, but it's actually like a spray. So that there are products out there that are not FDA approved that are, you know, it goes back to the whole uh, colloidal silver kind of argument. You know, there yeah. are things out there that do things that help us become better. Um, they're if just you not end up blue, I'm going to know why. With that? What happened? Oh, yeah, yeah. If I turn Smurf blue. <laughs> yeah, I remember Smurf, dude. And that dude was like, yeah, man, I would do it again. It's like, you're stupid. Yeah. You are I mean, not I know, a spokesman. I know a lot of people who use colloidal silver without on, turning so blue. Cool they still blue. use so much. Yeah, I, I yeah. see. You know. I have my high level of skepticism about that shit. Like, I, I'm all about alternative oh, cure, right? But colonial silver, I, I think like um, surface level back to any bacterial and any fungal, it does right. fine for. It. But I think there's people like, oh, you have like stage eighteen. Metastatic ass cancer? Yeah, just spray some freaking colonial, colonial silver, silver on it and then take some coral calcium and you'll be fine. And I don't think it works that way. Yeah. Nope. That's along the no, line I mean, of the like, little EMF shields that people buy, those, those cute little things that they think that like blocks them from EMF radiation. It's like, no, that little disc absorbs EMFs, but you're still getting it everywhere else. Okay, so let's go on to owning your own health. A big part of being a free person is taking responsibility for your shitty decisions. And one shitty decision one might make is to drink too much alcohol and eat too much sugar and develop comorbidities, as we call mm -hmm. them. So the health, health conditions that are not good. I think all of the geese, you know, some of us went down the wrong path longer than others, but have realized you need to actually get your exercise and eat good food and 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 control these things. Because at the end of the day, if I weigh 250 pounds, I'm going to get obese person diseases. It's what's yep. going to happen. Yep. Yeah. Any any other thoughts on owning your health? Yeah, definitely. Like one of the things that really got me to turn around was one day I was listening to one of Ken Berry's videos. Mm hmm. And he said that in any major city today, there's pretty much, you could make some variables, but it's between somewhere between, for every five and 10 McDonald's that there is in a major city today, there's one dialysis clinic. <laughs> and the primary reason that dialysis clinic exists is to treat type 2 diabetes. And he went on to say, we should stop destroying the health of Americans and lying to them and calling type 2 diabetes type 2 diabetes. We should call type 2 diabetes what it really is, insulin resistance. It's not diabetes. It, it looks like diabetes because you give it to yourself, but if somebody's born with diabetes or they have like adult onset or, or late teen onset or what have you, it's a very bad pull on the genetic gen, uh, genetic roulette, right? Like it's, it's an awful thing to be born and then realize my gene sequences mean that I can't make insulin. Mm -hmm. That's a hard, like you can live with it. You can manage it. You can do your best with it, but it's a horrible thing. And to do it to yourself is totally disrespectful to the person that didn't have a choice. And it was one of those, one of several things that made me go, I got to, I know better. I got to fix this shit. Yeah. Right. And and I do think that there is a place for you made your bed, you lie in it. I still think we as a society have an obligation to do our best at any point that a person is at least willing to take the responsibility and, and make the change, no matter how much damage they've done. We should be helping people get well if we can, if there's anything left that we can do. I also think we need to be honest with everybody, because it might make more people not get to where I did or some of uh, the rest of us did and need to have that moment to, to fix it. Maybe think about it more in the beginning so we don't go there. That There are points where if we said we're going to take all the money we spent on national defense, we're going to take tons of money that we spend on other things, we're going to put it all in nothing but health care, and we're even going to run it efficiently. You can do enough damage to yourself where there can be the, a hundred of the best doctors in America with every resource they need. And they go, I'm sorry, you're going to die. 
There's nothing we can do for you. And there's kind of a like a series of bands as to what the percentage are that will be able to help you all the way back to where it's reasonable that we can make this person well. And there's a whole area of uncertainty between we know you're going to die and you're probably going to die that we can't do anything about. And we should be, instead of teaching children to eat the freaking food pyramid or whatever in school, we should be teaching children the reality of that. If you are morbidly obese by the time you're 15 years old, you're probably going to destroy your liver, kidneys, or both by the time you're 40. Before you even get to destroy your heart like Americans of your previous generation did, you're going to blow up your kidneys or your liver or both. And if we're not going to be honest with people about that, we're never going to fix this problem. We're headed for a path right now where more people will have diabetes that don't in another 10 years. That's that, right. Oh, God, where we're headed. That's not... Like sometimes I exaggerate a little bit or whatever. Like that's actually by the numbers and by the progression of the disease that if you take people over 30, by 2031, more people will have what we call diabetes than don't have it. That should scare the living fuck out of everybody hearing that. And it doesn't because nobody believes it because we don't teach people this. So I do think there is this personal responsibility we've shirked and lost. And we've now come to the idea that like the government should just do it, right? We should just have healthcare, single payer, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Single payer is code for socialized. Yeah. If you want to know what socialized there medicine looks somebody... like, by the way, look at COVID treatment. COVID treatment is socialized medicine. Everything's free, but if it's not on the line card, you don't get the treatment. So the VA. VA is actually not as bad it's as COVID up. treatment. Honestly. Somebody even... is fucked up though. Go ahead. VA is fucked up, but let's say I went to VA it is. and my doctor thinks, you know what? He needs this medicine. He's just going to give it to me, right? If you have COVID, there's literally a line card. Approved treatments at different stages. If it's not on that line card, a doctor's not going to give you the treatment, such as you're dehydrated. Everybody knows you're dehydrated. You go into an ER, they lift up your skin and they pinch it. And when they let go, it stays sticking up. That's like you're about to die, but it's you have COVID. No, no you have. De- I don't do. care why you have dehydration, right? You have now. If you go to VA hospital as a veteran, and you go into their ER and you're severely dehydrated, as fucked up as it is, they're gonna pump fluids into you quickly. If you, I'm telling you, if you go to the average ER right now with severe dehydration while you have COVID, they're gonna tell you why they can't give you fluids. And that's what fully socialized medicine is going to look like. And if you you can't argue that it won't, because that's what it is, right? This is what step. I don't think people understand this. If you go to the hospital with COVID and they're putting it down as treatment for COVID, you don't pay a bill. Insurance, no insurance, it doesn't matter. You don't pay a you bill. Don't pay a bill. Yeah. The government pays the bill. Well, the government now has set a line card: what you can do, when you can do it, and how you have to do it. And if the hospital bills it as a COVID expense. The insurance company says, not our problem, right? Not our problem. Sorry, bye. The government says, not what we said you can do. Now, if they had a brain in their head and they're doctors, you would think they're smart people. They would say, we're treating you for dehydration here and COVID here, but they can't figure out how to do it. Probably because the systems admin didn't put it into the computer where they can bill it that way. It's all about the the and 100% that's all about the codes. You have to tell it. them that's you're like, for like dehydration, not COVID. Yeah. 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 I, I'm not, yeah, so I'm not somebody... billing you for COVID treatment. I'm billing you for, like, this person's going to die. And this is why your hospitalization rate with high COVID is going through the roof right now. Because if we had just done what most people would have done, Dorothy's dehydrated, go to the ER. She's dehydrated, give her fluids. No, we can't give her fluids. Either right away or the next day. Because you're ne- once you get a certain deficit with dehydration, you can't catch up by drinking. You've got to get IV fluids. You have to do it. And day, next day or two, she would have been in the hospital. Once she was fully in the hospital, you know what they would have done? They would have given her an IV. She would have gotten fluids, but would have been a byproduct of treatment. And they would have said, here's a COVID patient that needed to be hospitalized. But what you had is a person that needed to be treated for dehydration. This is insane. And this is, this is, that is, I I cannot overemphasize this. That is socialized medicine. And I would say that, okay, if, if Mexico went to Afghanistan 
as fucked up as they are, they would have done a better job where we started at with withdraw. I think the Mexican president would have done a better job withdrawing from Afghanistan than Joseph Biden. And I don't think it's a Biden problem. I think it's a massive bloated bureaucracy of America problem. And is as bad as socialized medicine can be in Britain or Germany or whatever. I think what we need to understand is there's no utopia here. They do a better job than we ever will. Common sense. Daniel Common sense. No country in, will fuck Let me this say, up I'm interrupting you, Jack, because I'm right. seeing a comment that yeah. single payer fixes the relationship where you, you are beholden to your employer because they have your insurance. It fixes some of that and guarantees minimum coverage. Wrong. It guarantees that you are now beholden to the government and they can say yes and no whether you have the jab or not. No jab, no service. Yep. And it also lets them ration no jab, it no out. Job. If you look at countries that have single payer systems, they people who need to get care for things die waiting for it because well, the government yeah. is now the customer. The patient is not. It changes nothing in the overall market forces. Xavier, you've been trying to say something for like yeah. 10 minutes, though. So stay your thing. Go ahead, man. Speak up. I'll be right back. Yeah. So the thing is, is that in the chat, there was somebody who asked what to do about, you know, being li living a nomadic lifestyle, you know, like a digital nomad. Um, I was actually just looking up uh, travel insurance and it's pretty fucking reasonable. There's a bunch of them that have $500,000 medical coverage, um, medical evacuation if you need it, but medical coverage. And some of them have a million dollar plans and they're really inexpensive. So if you are a digital nomad and you're traveling around the world and you don't mind structuring your travel trips to fit sort of like the the insurance plans ideal uh lack of uh exposure kind of coverage you know you could actually have a much better health insurance plan um uh, being a digital nomad so that that is an option and then you couple that with the the medical tourism and then you've got you know probably world class healthcare instead of having to be stuck with the 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 now socialized medical system here in the states. Yeah, well we're kind of And more a good of a resource for system. that is square What is it? Yeah, squaremouth. squaremouth.com. squaremouth.com. It'll it'll give you a bunch of different it's kind of like a kayak uh, or you know travel kind of aggregator but for travel insurance. Yeah. So can I back up real quick before we move on about this yeah. whole thing about it separating from your employer? Um, I was an evil employer at one time. And okay, when I say I'm an owner, I owned 15% of this company. I didn't own the whole thing, but I was an owner of the company. We had over 80 employees and we had 2,600 contractors. And we provided insurance for our contractors based on how much they worked and how much we would pay for it. And we provided insurance for full coverage for all our employees. The total number of times that I, anybody else that owned that company, any officer in that company, any director in that company, the, the, the human resources person got a phone call asking whether or not somebody could get treatment for medical care was absolutely fucking zero. Your employer has no impact whatsoever on whether or not the insurance that you have through them provides coverage. That's a decision made by the insurance provider based on the contract that you have with them as their customer. So I don't know where this idea that your employer is in any way impeding your health care because that is not the case. I think it's more that if you leave your job, you lose your coverage and you can't afford I the other you. options, which yeah. is, you know, um, in some countries, your insurance follows you. So no matter you pay what. for your insurance or your employer pays for your insurance, depending on where you are. But when you leave, if it was $60 a month, it's still $60 a month. You're just paying it now. And, and then your next employer must pick it up if they have to pay, if, if they right. have to pay it, it, for I it. Mean, regulations around healthcare in, in different countries are so all different. very different. But the idea that, you know, like the, the novel idea that insurance- Oh, tying it to your employment. Person. Yeah. Okay. That's a fair yeah. point. I get and, that. And, and I understand that because I know people who can't leave their job because they have really bad health conditions. And, and they, they have they great insurance. Like yeah. they get covered. Yeah. Um, but you know, changing that from employer to government doesn't change anything. No, no, but I will say like from a free market standpoint, if I'm the entrepreneur, the best thing you can do for me as an entrepreneur, not for me as a person that needs medical care, but you can remove from me the burden of needing to worry about health insurance. 
This is why it's actually very difficult for an American company to compete. You know, Chinese is one thing, but even Japanese. Because a Japanese employer, when Nicole goes to work for them, says, your cost of cost of insurance to me is zero dollars. It's government provided. So the employer bears no responsibility. And there is a benefit to that as an entrepreneur, right? In that I don't get that question. Like if, if you sat down and interview with me for a job tomorrow, mm -hmm. one of the things you would say is, well, what do you do for health insurance? And if I'm a small time guy and I can't give you insurance, and, you know, Super Duper Inc. over across the street, Spacely Sprockets, right, right, can say, well, yeah, we pay $2 less than Jack Inc., but we provide full health insurance. Which job is the average person going to take? So this is one of those things I'm not advocating for it, but I'm saying, like, you will hear this case made that for the business ownership and for the ability to hire and to pay people well and all, the best thing you could do is have single payer because it was, it removes me from the equation as an account, like from an accountant side, it doesn't mean you're going to have a good solution, but for me, the business owner, it's true. Yeah. The simpler solution from my perspective would have been as an individual, I get the tax deduction for my, for my insurance payment. Right. Cause the it's corporation, not, it's okay. a tax deduction. Right. And then I provide it as a benefit to my, my employee. But if I'm a sole proprietor and I pay $250 a month for insurance, then that's just money I spend for insurance. It's not deductible. Oh, it is. There no, are ways. I know there are ways, but for a lot of people, it is not. Oh, you or just... if they're with, if they have an employer who does not provide it, it is not. I know what if, I If do. you have an employer that doesn't provide it, you're out. Yeah. If you are self-employed, I don't care if you're 1099, you just put that shit down as an expense and and it's not a problem. I've been doing it for 11 years. You don't have to run it through your corporation and pay it for yourself. And then you don't have to go through all that shit. Um, especially since Obamacare, there's, you just have to make, I, I'm not an accountant. That's why I hire accountants. You just have to make sure you put it down on the paper. Right. But yeah, but it, and I'll tell you, it does make it sting less. It's still expensive. It's expensive. It's and, still expensive. You know, the but, safety net here is Medicaid. If you can no longer work, you probably qualify for Medicaid. The now, problem everybody is all qualifies the people that make, for Medicaid, but that's money. what Medicaid has been designed to do. And Medicaid sucks. That's the other thing. Medicaid sucks. It's the people that make just barely too much money. Yeah. And they're still poor and they don't qualify. I had a guy work for me one time. He was kind of a, he was kind of new. It wasn't like he was being yeah. this is a long time ago. I think we paid him nine dollars and fifty cents an hour. He had two kids and a wife, and the wife didn't work, and he didn't qualify for Medicaid for his kids. Now, it was mid-90s, but you're still, I mean, really? Like, do you think in 1995, if you made nine fifty an hour with two kids and a wife, you were even close to middle class, let alone wealthy? Yeah. So, it's all a fuck. It's just... I, I mean, even... the whole thing is a shit show. And it has been by design. I is mean, I think it is you're by muted, design. Dude. Let's huh? unmute. It. Look, we have to unmute X. He's, he muted himself again, and he doesn't mute. know it. X, what do you got to say? I can't unmute him. I think he's trying to unmute him, and I'm trying to unmute him at the same time. Wait. I can't unmute your guest. No, I'm sorry. I have to go. I have a medical emergency. Got to go. Bye. Oh, oh shit. Well, that's not good. No, and it's also weirdly topical. It, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Since we had this topic. I'm sure we will hear back from okay. him. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody came in and talked to him. So I know he has uh, kids and a wife around. So maybe he right. needs to go. Um, maybe okay. he's hanging a kid upside down and hitting him in the back or something. No, I mean, hopefully it's hopefully it's not. We'll let you guys know in the show notes after yeah. that he's okay. Yeah. Um, I'll wait till I hear from him. He looks him pretty concerned. I say that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he shouldn't have told us he was leaving. He should just hang up. Yeah, yeah, when That's, it's like that. Yeah. Okay, so next item, Freedom Medicine Network. So I hear you tell your IV story, and I, I have a friend who works in an emergency room who's like, well, I would just give them fluids. But he's one of those rare doctors who treats people still for what they have. And 
and he's also when I, I talked to him about the vaccine recently. Oh, I shouldn't say that word on your channel, should I? Um, I talked to him That's about fine. it. As long as we don't go talking about what actually. No, no, no. no. I talked to him about them. Like, what would you do? Because I like to hear people who are vehemently for it. I like to hear people who are against it. I like to hear all things in between because it helps me understand. A, I find other research and resources to read, and it just helps me figure out what I'm going to do long term. You know, like right now, I don't feel like I know enough to make the decision. So the decision is no, and it's not looking good. And he basically told me that he's seen side effects in the ER and uh, that with that compared to the risk of problems from the illness, he personally would not take it. But if somebody decides to, he's that's their decision, right? I agree. And, and I think about that person and other people you and I know in the medical world who are more freedom oriented. And I wonder why we haven't figured out the FMN or the Freedom Medicine Network where we can all go to people who are pro-freedom, who are willing to accept cash for service, and who are willing to consider some of these alternative things for treatments for stuff that maybe not, may not be the official mainstream antidote. How would that work? What do you mean, how would it work? I don't really understand what you're asking. How can we make it work? It's kind of like we've talked about Freedom Airlines, okay. right? Okay. Freedom Medicine. What does that mean? I think Freedom Medicine is that anybody can offer any service they want, assuming they're competent enough to do it, and then yeah. let the market actually compete. I think that like, you know, I'm pretty hard on Trump, but I think like a big part of actually even getting close to that is one of the things he did where we were talking about earlier, like you have to be able to know what your treatment costs. Like, yeah. I mean, and, and you, up until a year ago, you didn't know. You, you the, the hospital had no, like, okay, you need a triple bypass. Oh, well, what's it going to cost? Well, you need a triple bypass. Well, what's it going to, you see what I'm saying? Like, how yeah. can we even have freedom and competition in medicine? Because like, okay, I need a triple bypass, but I'm cognizant. I'm awake. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Maybe I need a second uh, opinion on whether I need to do this or not. That's one thing. But then maybe I also need to know like, hey, you know, Zale Lipsky right over in Dallas has one of the best cardiac units in the country. What's it, what's a triple bypass cost there? Because I'm kind of thinking if I'm at Arlington Memorial and they want to charge me like $100,000 and Zale Lipsky wants me to charge me $70,000, I'm kind of thinking Arlington's going to be dropping the price. Yeah. And I think until you get to where you can have price discovery, then I don't know that you can have it. Like, I think that's step one. What, what else does it look like? I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I mean, think you you know, everything has to be approved for treatment. And, and I, I find that to be, I find that to be a problem because I think that a doctor should be able to say, look, I just think if you, if you modify your diet in this way, you're going to be okay. Yeah. And, and, and people think they can, but they really can't. Like if you have high blood pressure. But they can. Th like they, I, the one I'm seeing does. Yeah. That's, but they had to start a private clinic where they address core underlying issues, including diet and lifestyle choices. See, like, it's absurd that for so many years I was so fat and nobody was willing say, to tell hey, me I was you, fat. You're fat. You need to lose weight and yeah. then you won't have the heart condition you're developing or whatever it is, right? And they'll say things like with proper diet and exercise, but they won't come out and say, look. You're fat. You're fat. Your ass is too yeah. big. You need to lose ass or you're going to die. Yeah. My Which veterinarian exactly told me that about about my dog, though. He's like, she needs to lose 15 pounds or she's going to get all these weird diseases. Right? But they won't tell me that. Yeah. And that's absurd. It is absurd, but everybody's offended by everything and everybody sues over everything and people actually can sue over things. And most doctors do not run private practices. Yeah. Most doctors work for hospitals or larger entities or things like that. Or there is a doctor that's in the private practice, but everybody else in that practice that actually sees people, like you mentioned vets, like different but same. Yeah. Our veterinary is a VCA clinic. Um, yeah. So they're more like a franchise type thing. Um, 
but one doctor is the doctor. He owns it. He operates it. He decides the way things are. He does whatever he wants. And then the rest are underneath him. He happens to be the good guy you're talking about. Like, because with, with dogs and cats, they tell you you have, or dogs, you have to treat them for uh, heartworms. Yeah. Well, you're supposed to test them for heartworms every year. Right. When they've been on treatment nonstop, their ten, t- dog's 10 years old, never not been on heartworm treatment, doesn't need a test. Every doctor in that place will tell you, we, I cannot prescribe the next year until they get tested. Well, the guy that runs the place, I'm like, we spent a lot of money here. We have two cats. We have three dogs. We have, you know, some, uh, some, you know, farm veterinary stuff and all. You want me to keep bringing my animals here? We're not doing this anymore. And he goes, fine. But even with that, like none of his siblings will do that for me. And I got to believe they have more freedom there than they do in, in yeah, human. Yeah, they do. Cause I've, I've been to one that will do it without testing. If you tell them to, yeah. the reason the testing is there is so they can prove to the drug company that, that it was heartworm free. And if any time in the next 12 months, heartworms are found in your animal, the drug company treats it for Pays free. Pays the treatment. Yeah. Right. We, don't, we don't give a shit about that. Like, right. because that's no, like a dog on treatment's not going to get freaking heartworms. It's, it's right. not a thing. Right. Right. And that's once. So here it's once a year that they, they test, but the treatment lasts for six months that you get. So, mm. so you get it twice and then you do it again. But that's, I mean, I guess we're straying, but we're not because it's that same side of weird. Okay. That's a bureaucracy yeah. created by the pharmaceutical company. Exactly. And there's plenty of that in human medicine. There's actually a lot totally. more. Of it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think you need a third booster shot? <laughs> because Pfizer's board of directors figured out that they're going to make an extra, it's something like $49 billion. Why does your own immunity from having had it not count? Why has why is that the case when it never hasn't before? Right. When we when we decided we were going to vaccinate the world right. for smallpox, and we sent people into like roping out of helicopters in the middle of friggin' Middle East and shit, vaccinating the world, right? And we came up to somebody and had a bunch of pock marks, and they said, "I don't want a vaccine. I already have smallpox." You know what we said? Okay. Cool. God bless you for not dying. You're one of the 75% that survived instead of 25% that died. Sorry you have pot marks on your face, but you have immunity. Goodbye. We have never done this before. And I think, like, it's easy for us to stray into this world away from our subject of what is the, the solution to this problem. Yeah. But this is the problem. Like, the reason we have this huge expense to basic health care is because of this. Well, because if that makes sense. Is it the are you talking about the the wanting to treat everybody for everything or the fear of letting people die who are gonna die? Both, but I'm really talking about now, like what you're seeing them do with the COVIDs, yeah. right? What you're seeing mm-hmm. them do with the COVIDs is the problem. I think that what an interesting thing is about how this whole pandemic thing came together is that we have all these parents going, distance learning doesn't work. Distance learning is terrible. My grandkids are here every day participating in distance learning from a private institution, and it's fabulous. There's nothing wrong with distance learning. The problems with the teachers conducting the distance learning. Correct. That's where your problem is. So what happened was America's parents got to see how shitty – the teachers that were teaching their children really are. And they said, well, we've been told for as long as we've been alive. Teachers are heroes that don't wear capes. There's no way the teacher can be this bad. It must be the distance learning. It's not the distance learning. Being on a Zoom meeting does not make you a good or a bad presenter. We have people negotiating multi-billion dollar contracts all over the world for the last 15 years, doing just fine with a Zoom meeting. We're talking to people on StreamYard, but it works the same way. Right now, you're hearing us. I'm either a good presenter, Nicole's either a good presenter, or we suck, right? It is what it is. These teachers are not bad teachers because they're doing it remotely. They're bad teachers because when you hire this many people, to do a mundane job where everybody's paid the same, some portion of them are going to suck. 
Yeah. It's funny because I got to watch Zoom teaching it among four children. And totally different. Three of the four teachers were really good at it. They were great. They're like singing with the kids and yep. doing all this stuff and doing side groups and having them do group activities. And one teacher sucked at it so badly that she'd be on for 15 minutes and say, okay, go do stuff. Never mind, we're skipping that because it's distance. And that that one child the whole year got almost no instruction until they went live again. And even then, guess what? Shock, the instruction wasn't very good. Because that person wasn't good. Now, what that I'm person saying, was not a good teacher and they weren't good on Zoom or in the classroom. So I didn't go on that just to kick teachers. Right. What I'm saying is the analogy is all the shit you're seeing from the pharmaceutical industry, the 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 scientific community, which is really the scientific authority, and the medical community, yeah. all of the stuff you're seeing that you're like, I can't believe this. All COVID did was put it front and center so you can see it. This is the way that it's been for years. And it I have to say it wasn't always. Like nothing about this surprised me as to how bad it was. Um, but I just don't feel like 25 years ago it was this bad. Right. I, I re it wasn't good, but it wasn't this bad. And I think that like what COVID did with so many things was go, hey, here's the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Take a look and see what it really looks like. Well, because then we the, the reaction is this. La, 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 yeah. La, la, la. yeah. <laughs> that was but the I mean, I think that, like with the, the thing with, with their kids, like most people – You've never seen your child taught for five minutes in school before COVID. You've never saw it. Kid goes to school. Kid comes home. You have parent-teacher night, what, once a year if you're lucky. You go in, you meet. You're there for five minutes. Oh, Susie does good. Susie does bad. Susie listens. Susie doesn't. You go home. COVID? Well, shit, I'm stuck home. Kids are stuck home. Let's log Johnny in. Let's see Mrs. Johnson teach Johnny. And you're like, Mrs. Johnson can't be this bad. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. And that's why my kids are going to Excellus Academy, right? That one teacher is teaching 30, 40, 50,000 kids. You know why? They needed one teacher to teach one class, and they found the best individual teacher to teach that class to that age group they could get, and because it's done remotely, it's infinitely scalable. That teacher's not sitting there going, okay, it's 8, 10, start. That teacher recorded those lessons, put them online, and then there's, there's additional teachers that can help students that have problems, and if the kid sails through that, like a lot of kids do, they don't bother those other teachers. If the kid has problems, they come to a teacher, and if they get to a teacher that can't help them, they're like, oh, this kid is more predisposed this way. They hand them off to a teacher that's good toward that predisposition. That is taking modern technology, and it's making teaching the best we can with what we have. Somehow we should be doing that with medicine, but as hard as it is with education, I think it's impossible with medicine right now. I don't think we can do it. Well, I think the barriers to getting a Freedom Medical Network going – are built into the law. They're baked into the law yeah. and it's in the licensure issue. Yeah. And we need to, we need to think of a way around it because where we're going right now, the system that has worked for you and me for things like bee sting treatments, it's, it's going away. Work. It's going it's away. No, yeah. I agree. And I think the difference is like when we're comparing the two worlds, Yeah. if you create a private school, unless you're like stringing children up by their thumbs or something, you're pretty free. It's expensive yeah. relatively because it's more money than you're already paying, right? Because you're if you are sending your kids to public school, you're paying for it. If you're renting, property taxes are baked in. If you're buying a house, you're paying property taxes. Yeah. Right. Any cost for a uh, private school, right, is more. So it's inherently expensive at that point. But if you're if you have the money, you have the means, you're willing to pay it, or you're gonna homeschool, in most instances, the state is hands off medicine. Oh, you're an LVN. Oh, you have a license. You have a set of protocols you have to follow. You want to lose your license? Right. Because you don't have to be licensed to be a private school teacher. Oh, you're practicing without a license. 
Yeah. Oh, well, no, we just decided Probably. that you're practicing without a license. Yeah. We just took your license away. LVN, RN, uh, an NP, a PA, a doctor, all of those come with these attachments. And it's also kind of a fascist system because the American Medical, Asso Medical Association has Very a great fascist. deal of control mm -hmm. over what is and what is it okay. And so does the government at the same time. But the AMA is a labor union. It is not a government entity in any way whatsoever, but they have in some ways more power than the government has. And yet the government has all these additional extra powers and this ability to take away a license. The AMA can't take your license away, but guess what? If the AMA recommends your license is taken away, it's out, it's gone. It's gone, right? It's like gone. Was, and if you practice medicine without a license, you get in big trouble. Big, you, oh, you go to prison. Like right. you don't go to jail. You go. And I don't prison. know the loophole. I would love it if somebody listening's like, I know a loophole. Medical church. Like I don't know what that looks like, but if there's a loophole. I can think of a lot of geese that would like to take advantage of that loophole, some of whom are medical professionals. Right? Oh, well, I think that maybe we're getting an opportunity right now. Yeah. Because if you said that two and a half years ago, I would have said, I love you, Nicole, but what crack are you smoking? <laughs> right. And the reason was anybody with All a crack, baby. Woo! Right. Anybody with a degree would have said, what the hell am I going to go work for this weird crackpot entity for? I have every doctor, every hospital, every clinic. I can go into private practice. Like, like the, the system worked really well two years ago for the medical professional. Yes. It worked really, even if it wasn't right or perfect or good or benevolent, it worked. If you had a medical degree and you had a, you were a doctor and you were a licensed medical doctor or a licensed, especially like a surgeon, a specialist, whatever, the system was very much, it was a guild. That's what, the, like I said, when the AMA is a, a, a union, it's a guild. It's designed to suppress competition and to elevate expenses. That's what it's, that's what unions do. And it worked really good for you. Well, how's it work for you? If you're a 32-year-old doctor that just got out of all the shit you did to get to be a doctor, you went through your fellowship and your residency and whatever, you're in the prime of your life, you're an excellent surgeon, and you look at this and you go, I don't want to get the jab right? because I've seen my own patients who are 18-year-old kids get inflamed hearts, and I don't want that, and you say no. What does the system do with you right now? And what it does is it spits you out. You were a cardiothoracic surgeon at Houston Methodist, right? And you're out. One of the top hospitals in or the state of Texas. Or you're in the Texas. state of California. Everybody right? in the state of California. Is Everybody in California. But even Texas, like Houston Methodist, yeah. has one of the top cardiac units in the country. People come from other states to get cardiac surgery there because they're that good. And you just got the bounce, because you refuse to get a vaccine. I think that's actually an opportunity. It is. And, and my understanding, I don't want to exaggerate a number, but my understanding is the percentage of medical professionals refusing the shot right now is about 30 to 35%. That's a lot of fucking doctors. That's enough nurses. for me to be like, I'll give you my extra dollars to go to you. That's the other thing. Like Those they need to create their own. Them. And, and they're not poor, right? Right. Like if you're talking cardiothoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons, these are people that make millions of dollars a year. And some of them are literally saying, like the doctors are smarter than the nurses here. And I don't mean as professionals. I mean in the way they're handling it. And that's why yeah. less of the doctors have been released so far. The nurses are, going, are being told, if you don't do this, you have to resign. And they're yeah. saying, okay, I resign. Yeah. The doctors are saying, fire okay, me, fire bitch. Me. Yeah. Fire me, bitch, because I'm like, and, and they're like, have you met my 18 lawyers? Fire me. And so what they're doing right now is they're threatening to fire, yeah. but they're not firing the surgeons and the high-end doctors. They're letting the nurses, the MAs, the LVNs, the NPs and all, those folks are resigning because they think they have no alternative. But what they're about to do, because in about if they're thinking it's September, yeah. they're going to get FDA approval, yeah. right? And then, and then they're, they're going to be like, well, now it's approved. Now we're not afraid to be sued. Now you're fired. 
And to me, okay, you got, you're talking top surgeons, top doctors, top nurses. And these people are obviously not anti-science. They're obviously not anti-vax. All these people I've heard talk are like, I've been vaccinated for tetanus. I've been vaccinated for smallpox. I've been, like I've been vaccinated for everything that normal people get vaccinated for. And I look at this and, you know, the guy's like an OBGYN. He's like, I just had a, a woman have a miscarriage and I've been doing this for 15 years and I've never seen a miscarriage look like this in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting this. And those people are not just going to go away. So I think if there's ever, like as bad as this is, if there's ever been a chance to create this parallel system, it is now, now but I yeah, don't know. So guys, if you're out there creating the parallel system, email us. Yeah, tell us. Go to unloosethegoose.com, click on the contact thing, and that email comes to us. We see them. And I'd be happy to spread the news of places that people can go or private clinics because that's it's going to become something people are seeking. It's already something people are seeking. And I mean, to the extent that geese can support other geese, we should do it. Yeah. I mean, I went so far, me and my web dude, Tom, we, we were, um, we're probably still going to do this. We're going to create a job site. There could be a whole medical section just for jobs that don't require a vaccination. And yeah. so I, I bought the domain, no jab job dot jobs. Mm hmm. But what it turned out that you can't buy a dot jobs domain unless it matches your company. You have corporate paperwork. Oh, bummer. So I'm still waiting. It's like 170 bucks here. And I'm like, fuck it. I'll do it. I'm still waiting <laughs> for my, uh, my <laughs> refund on it, but we're going to put together basically a job board just for companies that want to hire people without jobs. So we're going to do it completely anonymous. We're basically the company advertises the job, but not what company it is. Yeah. And the applicant and the company, uh, the, like the HR people, they only know each other once they agree to an interview. Okay. That that way we can't have the uh, the freaking cancel mafia go start after people. slamming companies just because we're listing a job. Because you know uh, it'll happen. I do know it'll happen. Total props to you for cancel mafia instead of cancel co culture. I, by the I way, I think it's called. cancel mafia. 100%. It is. It That's is how they behave. It is. Okay, I think we're about well, done, aren't we? We're just about done. So we covered like the options we have. We have health shares, cash clinics, subscription medicine or concierge medicine, catastrophic plans, medical tourism as all as options that you can do. And then the most important thing is own your health. Learn about herbal remedies. It's way better to use an herbal remedy that works first rather than go into something harder core. And if you can, you know, find a medical advisor or doctor who believes that that's even better. If, but there's no reason not to grow things in your own backyard that work. And I mean, Jack talks about his, this on his podcast. I talk about it on my podcast. I'm sure Xavier has a lot of knowledge about what you can just wild craft to make yourself feel better. Um, and then weight and diet's a big thing. You know, people have been talking about, is it better if you grow your own food? Yes. If you don't grow your own food though, find some people nearby who grow food and buy food from them. If you can't do that, Stick to whole foods. You know, we've talked a lot about eat keto. Meat. Huh? Eat meat. Eat meat. Yeah, Stop absolutely. Stop eating sugar. And if it's a starch, it's a sugar. Yeah. I I, I, I don't want to turn preachy on this, but I eat as much food as I want. Three years ago, I was 267 pounds. And I'll, I'll weigh in every morning now between 199 and 201. And if I'm hungry, I eat, but I eat mostly ribeyes and pork chops and bacon. And um, I know that's hard to believe, but if you just sat here and listened to us ran against the system, the system's the one telling you to eat oatmeal. Right. The system's the one telling you to eat grains. And we adopted this nonsensical food pyramid about 40 years ago. And you can literally look at the obesity rate in America and you can see when we adopted it and yeah. it does, it does this and it never goes back down. It, when we based our diet on grains as a recommendation versus like humanity did base a lot of their diets on grains over the years in different cultures and different times and different places because they were poor, not because they wanted to. 
right? That that's the main reason we did this because you can buy a fifty gal a fifty pound sack of wheat for what I don't know fifteen Less bucks twenty bucks twenty five bucks yeah, yeah right like it's COVID so, now it's twenty five bucks okay twenty five bucks for a fifty pounds of wheat fifty cents a pound it's yeah. cheap but nobody wanted to eat that way so if you're poor and you're eating away because you're poor and you don't have welfare and food stamps and all that. You might eat bad food, but you don't eat a whole lot of it because you only have so much money to buy food with. When you get wealthy and you, and when I say wealthy, I mean middle class, lower middle class in America is way wealthier than the rest of the world. And you start living on grains, you're going to be fat and you're going to have that, you know, one dialysis clinic to every 10 McDonald's in every major city. Like you're going to have that. And, and we didn't have this. 40 years ago. And if we look right now, like one of our one of our biggest expenses in medicine, and it will be our single biggest expense within five years, is type 2 diabetes. And because we have to look at all the things that we call something else that are because type 2 diabetes, right? right. If you have congestive heart failure, but you have congestive heart failure because of type 2 diabetes, what are we really treating? Type 2 diabetes. And that's where we're at today. And God, please stop eating this garbage. You are a you are a predator. That's how you were designed. The human being evolved by smashing bones open and sucking marrow out. That's how we know this from the anthropological record. Marrow's almost pure fat. Eat meat. I don't want to. I'll let it go. But yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I'm just you're an all in kind of person, and I'm yeah. on board. I say first step: nothing processed or no sugar. Okay. I agree. I'd just rather you just eat. get rid of that first. And it's going to feel like shit when you do it. And and if you're eating fruit, I'd rather you eat fruit than sugar. But over time, you need to reduce the fruits and the grains. No, fruit will kill you. Blow your liver. I up. know. Sorry. But, you know. But I am I am like pro, you know, whole coke. foods, unprocessed, etc. Don't get into juicing. That's pure sugar. Yeah, that's a bad like idea. You take, you take the apple and all the fiber and all the other material and you just get rid of it and go pure sugar. There's more sugar in an ounce of apple juice than, than two ounces of soda. Right. I mean, that's, that's reality. Um, be careful guys. It's just, nah. Yeah. Okay. I'd rather you make whole grain, fresh bread than eat Twinkies. Right. I'll, I'll agree with you. Yeah. Just get that first step and then more steps come. That's just the way it is. Okay. So we're ready for snooker the goose. This okay. is where you get to ask me a question. I get to ask you a question. Do you have a question for me? You go first. Okay. How many people do you think you're going to allow register for your fall workshop? Oh, I know year? the answer. 60. 60? 60, because 60 is going to result in 65 when certain people whine and bitch and say, but you said and you forgot and whatever. <laughs> so that's going to be 65 students. This is going to be 80 total head count, which is what we did last fall. And I pretty much, I don't know about you, but I looked at it last fall and went, we can do this. And like two more people will make the property tip upside down. Like yeah, we yeah. were done. Like that was, that's what we could do. So I'm going to do 60, 60 registrations with an understanding there's probably, you know, two or three people I promised and forgot about. And then there'll be somebody that I like, nah, shit, fine. Yeah. And so it'll be 65 total students and probably about 15 staff. You're, okay. you're considered staff, by the way. I know. All right. right. Cool. All right. What, what are you going to hit me with? How many pounds of coffee are you going to bring to fill up and caffeinate all these people that are going to be at the fall workshop? Well, that's a two-part question, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Not for sale. I will bring 12 pounds. And I'll do it. You guys only go through 12 pounds, uh, okay. but I do base all of my event estimates based on an 80 person head count and 12 pounds of coffee over three days. But I'll bring another 150 pounds for everybody attending there because they end up buying a bunch of coffee. Buying it. Okay. So it's I think it's we actually, need to go two rounds because it's just us tonight. Yeah. Okay. You got another one? I got to think for a second. Uh, I'll, throw, I'll throw one at you then. Okay. And then you throw one at me. Okay. Are you going to finally build a fucking pond on your property? I have every intention of putting a Miyagi <laughs> in this spring as my spring workshop. Uh, and it would be awesome if you wanted to come help us do that. I also need the tarp Nazi for this. Oh, project. yeah. Harry the tarp Nazi. <laughs> I don't know about that. Nazi. 
Yeah. I just want you, I just want to advise you that I think it makes a lot of sense for you to dig a deep hole. I have a backhoe guy. Don't That's covered. Don't build up, build down on your mm. property. If you want the Miyagi look, only go up a little bit, you know, like just enough to keep the ducks out or something because put that pressure and then you have like much more cold climate in the winter. Yeah. Like don't build it. Like you can dig a hole anywhere there. I don't even know if you need a liner. I might I probably can need, create I'm the right shape. I think if you just pound that freaking orange clay of yours, you just make a regular pond. It depends where it is. Yeah. We won't know how we dig. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know where it's going to go too. So, <laughs> but, right. but I have a great backhoe guy now. I just found him this year. What else you got for me? Okay. Do you think in the next five years, you're going to raise any other livestock on your three acres besides ducks? And if so, what would that livestock be? What are you thinking about? The chickens don't count then, I guess, because we already have them and either do yeah, third. Yeah, they don't count. Um, if I do anything else, and I haven't yet, because it's like one more thing. What I'm actually always wanted to do for a meat and egg product is pigeons. Oh. Because pigeons will leave, yeah. they'll forage, and they come back. And it actually is a thing that I feel like I, I kind of owe it to the community to do just to create, because there's not a good tutorial. There's tutorials on like racing pigeons and homing pigeons and all that like shit like that. But it's one of the most consumed proteins in the desert parts of the world because they're such hardy birds. And if you think about it in any major city and even most suburbs, there's some overpass somewhere. Yeah. Pigeons, right? So if you take pigeons and you make sure you have a certain number of males and females and you put them into places, they will naturally pair up. They're, they basically mate for life until one's gone. Like we're together, but she left. So screw her. That's kind of how they are. And it doesn't take long for that to happen. And it takes about a week to three to yeah. home a pigeon. Like a totally wild pigeon will be like, oh, I live here now. And now you can let them out. And so you have an animal that you can feed and you do need to feed them some because that's what makes them be like, this is where I live. Right. But they can gain so like, they're like, they're basically big doves mm -hmm. and they can go anywhere they want. And then they come back. And if you lose one or two, it's, you know, go down the bridge and get some more. And like, I feel like I should be doing this entire series on how to do this. Cause my, my uncle was a pigeon man for shooting pigeons. Like that was a thing in Pennsylvania back then you actually yeah. shot pigeons and there was yeah. money, lots of money on it. stuff. but the way you get a pigeon, you go out to these places where the pigeons live and you take a box, you put no bottom on it. You put chicken wire around it and you make a grid with thick wire on the roof and you make squares about four inch square like that. Mm -hmm. And you feed the pigeons every day for a couple weeks and you lay the box with the bottom sitting up with food in the box. Yeah. And the pigeons eat all around the box. They go in the box. They fly away. They become a, the box is not scary anymore. And once the pigeons are feeding well, you flip the box over. So those grid is on the top. Yeah. You do the same thing. And when you come back, what happens is the pigeons land on the top of the box. They fold their wings. They drop in the box because they're not afraid of it anymore. Right. They can't fly out. They try uh, to fly out. They can't get out of the grid. And you just stick your hand and grab the pigeons and keep feeding them. And you take as many as you want. And then you take the trap away. So like literally anybody could with no real money, you could use scrap wood and shit you find laying around, build like pigeon, they call them dove coats. They're basically yeah. like houses. And then you have a certain amount of size that you give to each bird and you give them two little shelves in there. And they'll actually raise two clutches of birds spaced out in time at the same time, mm -hmm. take care of themselves. And I'm not, I don't know that I'm going to do it because my wife will kill me if I add one more thing, but <laughs> if I was going to do it. And the cool thing is you can actually, these coats, they learn their coats. Yeah. You can move them. So you can literally take like a pipe and put it in the ground. And these are big. So you might need two people to move one. You lift them up and stick them in the ground and as long as you move them like within sight of the previous location, they'll just start using that. You can move them around and spread their manure. Oh, that's even better. Right? People no grow them in poop. People in the Middle East grow them like in their attics and stuff, but you can move them around these mobile coats or you can do a coop. You can do like a, a pigeon coop or whatever. But 
it's really something that's so underutilized here. And like rabbits, you got to take care of them and they get too hot. Like if the pigeon gets too hot, it goes and flies away in the woods for the afternoon. Right. And then it comes back. It's They're actually easier than chickens. So pigeons at TSP 2023? Maybe. <laughs> if you said 2021, I was like, no. 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 no but maybe, yeah. 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 Awesome. Okay, well, I think we're ready to wrap up. Before I do, I do want to mention that Xavier has checked in and he and okay. his family are all fine. Okay, so good. They're good. Um, and I want everybody who was just listening and maybe didn't see his comments to know that or if you're listening to this podcast. That was kind of like, a freak out. Yeah. I kind of feel like a kid choking on a Cheeto or something was the... Yeah, uh, <laughs> whatever it is, um, it's good. And he checked in. So okay. if, if you want to help this podcast, though, you can do it in a couple ways. One, give us some reviews on iTunes or other platforms. Reviews are always good. Go to UnloosedTheGoose.com and connect with us on social media. And if you liked this episode, recommend us to a friend because the more people we get into our network, the better off we are. That really helps grow the podcast and grow these thoughts that we're having about, oh, I don't know, the crazy idea that we can just be free and live as free people. So, Absolutely. I'm just real quick here. Somebody asked what a workshop is like. Yes. At TSP. So I am looking at right now trying to find one from fall last year because it'll be something, something like that. So I'm stalling just for a minute. Okay. Uh, project event workshop overview. So I'm going to drop that in for the people in the live stream right now yep. and we'll go ahead and wrap up. But this is what we did last year. It won't be the same, but it'll be similar. Uh, my workshops are we get a bunch of really freaking cool people together. We have a bunch of instructors. We we talk about a variety of topics. Uh, we have a great time. Uh, we have basically education during the daytime, lots of networking. And then we have a bar, an 1800 square foot bar room in the evenings. We have Very karaoke, fun. pool table, darts, all that shit. We have a blast. And if you want to come, you need to pay attention and you need to get on our distribution list over at the Survival Podcast, not ULG. Our average workshop will share will sell out in less than an hour. Yeah. Last our year it sold ones, out in two minutes. Yeah. Our spring ones will sell out. You know, they might take a couple of days because they're smaller. Yeah. And Nicole does hers at the same time. And I always promote Nicole's before my own and what have you. But when I do the fall ones, people know that's a big one. Yeah, last year was two minutes. Yeah, mine sold out I mean, super fast last year too. Literally two minutes. And then like I was watching it and I can only put so many cars in. So like I'm like, people are trapped because I have a thing on my questionnaire. Like, are you driving? Are you coming with a group? And I'm, how many cars is that? Okay, I can add five more. And then they were gone and it was it was insane. So if you want to come and you do want to come, you then you need come. to pay attention because it's, mm -hmm. I, I don't say that. You know, you know, Nicole, I don't say I don't. that because I'm worried about selling it out. I'm, I say that because people that really want to come, I feel like most times last year, I don't know. Otherwise, if you really wanted to come, you could come. But if I said the tickets went on sale at 8 a.m. on Saturday and you got up at 930 on Saturday, you could not come. You're not coming. Even yeah. five years ago, you're not coming. It's not yeah. happening. And I guess Nicole will have hers in the spring. Yeah. Hers is awesome, too. And I will be at Float Fest. I don't know if you're coming, Nicole, but I'll be at Float Fest in Texas in the spring next year, too. Yeah, so I, it depends. If, if it's in March, I'll be there. But if they move it it's to March. April. Oh, yeah, then I'll be there. I'm celebrity chefing. I have no yeah. idea what that means, but Brian got me into it. And yeah. Yeah, we're doing fun. we're we're doing that together. So there may be a, any other geese. We're trying to all camp together and have a goose enclave at Float Fest. And, and I may be doing very soon announcing sometime this fall or winter um, a shark fishing and coast fishing and hang out a cool Airbnb weekend. Oh, fun. Yeah, that'll be like eight people or something like that. But that, yeah, yeah that, that's probably coming too. Awesome. And you guys, anytime you can get a chance to be in li live with people, do it. It yeah. really helps get not those just us, close, anybody. Yeah, anybody. Close relationships. Get your people together near you. It's it's very important to do that and keep those relationships fresh. All right. We're at almost two hours. I'm done. Yeah. I think it's a wrap. So thanks everybody for joining in. And we will see you next time. Honk.